Okay, I would like to welcome everyone, which means only the here this time. So, uh, so today I'll be discussing uh, two chapters, chapter five and chapter six. Um, they're very short chapters and they're very basic. Uh, so to start with, for chapter five, named Understanding Network Data Structures, uh, I think the main objective of this uh, chapter is just to have understanding of how to go from the the data structure you have to the network that you would like to produce. So we have already touched upon this uh, in the previous meeting, but today we'll go back and revisit some of the of the ideas. So there are two ways to make a network. Uh, one of them is to start with an edge list. So for each network, the underlying network, as we have said last time, you have the, your com the components, and these components are either the the agents or the entities, the nodes of the network, and then the relationships between these nodes that define the network. And these nodes can, they have many names, the relationship, links, or edges. And uh, if you could enumerate all the edges in the networks or all the relationships in the network, uh, which consists of the pairs, so you have one node connected to another node, then you have uh, an understanding of the whole network. And with this understanding, you can make a data structure out of the list of all the edges or the links, and then you can uh, make this. Uh, you can reproduce the structure of the whole network. So uh, here I've said a few things. Uh, so the list of relationships under the network among its components called the edge list. Uh, but anyway, you, you can always go back to uh, this text. But uh, I think I'll uh, mention all of them. So for example, here I have two vectors and these vectors have like uh, people. So I have uh, the relationships between people and we can make two vectors in R and then put these two vectors in a, in a data frame and then this data frame will be the edge list. So what defines an edge list? Basically because uh, it's a list of edges. So for each edge, you need two, uh, two pieces of information, uh, the node on the left and the node on the right. So this would mean that we'll need only two columns to define the edge list. And what about the rows? So in an edge list, uh, the number of rows represents the number of relationships, the number of edges. So here, for example, we have six edges. So this would mean that we have a network of relationships between people. And in this network, we have only six uh, edges, six connections between uh, the persons. Uh, in an undirected graph or an undirected network, the order of the columns will not be important. Uh, but if you have a directed network where there is a, a directionality to the relationship and you have a source and a receiver, then usually you will have the first column as the sender and the second column as the receiver. So this is uh, the, the edge list. It's an intuitive and a simple way to make a network. And uh, basically by looking at it, you can quickly see that uh, for this network, I have uh, six relationships. Uh, but with this advan the advantages, we have some disadvantages, which uh, for example, like this structure for a network doesn't support downstream analysis using uh, linear algebra, for example. So to apply any of the anal analysis me methods, you will have to first transform this structure into another structure, and then you can apply the analysis. Another uh, disadvantage, which is mentioned in the book, but I, I couldn't get it uh, actually, so I, I made the quotation here. So the author said that it's impossible with an edge list to represent isolates uh, since it details the relations. So I, it wasn't clear to me what he was trying to say. Uh, so here I added the quotations and I added the question mark, but uh, yeah, yes, please. I think I know what he means. Uh, isolates. I, I've never heard the term, but uh, I think it's when the node is uh, disconnected. So you can have disconnected graphs where uh, you have nodes that are not connected to the subgraph. I see. I see. Yeah, this would make sense. I would assume it's that. And yes, you cannot represent it in an edge list because yeah. you need two nodes to represent the link. That makes sense. Great, yeah. Uh, 
thanks thanks Vir. so yeah so now like it's not possible actually to to represent this in a data frame maybe other ways would be possible but it's not straightforward to represent isolate yeah in and in a matrix in a matrix it would be able to, uh, you would be able to represent it in an agency matrix it just yeah. means that the the intersection between uh, row one to column two Mm -hmm. uh, would be zero and the intersection of row two with column one would be zero if the the, the matrix is uh, ordered the same way you know uh, square matrix yeah i agree yeah so in the adjacency matrix it would be easier to represent uh, an isolate yeah yeah so well, that's a good point i will make sure to add this comment in the in the book as well uh, but uh, what I would like also to highlight uh, with the edge list is that you have some uh, redundancy. So, for example, here uh, in the first column, uh, you have you can uh, look you can see that you have the the same person, but it's repeated multiple times because uh, the person can have many relationships. Uh, so this is a good thing because it's uh, it's intuitive, it's easy to read. You can know that Mark has a relationship with Peter and Jill but uh, maybe it's, it's not efficient to store and uh, yeah so this might be also another disadvantage of edge list so because of these disadvantages uh, the recommended structure for working with uh, networks is adjacency matrices so for example this is an adjacency matrix here we have the the same persons from the previous edge list uh, on the here in uh, columns and rows and this adjacency matrix, it's a, it represents an undirected graph. And what you can see here is first it's symmetric. So uh, if you can see, if you go like for this uh, row for Mark, and then it's connected with Peter. But also, if you go here to Peter, you can see that it's connected to Mark. So the upper triangle and lower triangle are the same. And for adjacency matrix, so the 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 one of the, advan the advantages of using adjacency matrix is that it's efficient, especially when it comes to searching the connections. So here, for example, if I would like to see if there is a connection between two components, I can just index the name of one of the components, uh, Jill, for example, and then Peter, and then quickly see whether it's zero or one. But if I have an edge list, this would be more involved and it will uh, not be as efficient. Uh, yeah, so I think that uh, this is uh, one of the advantages, uh, the number of rows equal number of edges. Uh, no, so this is uh, wrong. So this is something from edge list. I will make sure to remove it. Uh, I can quickly remove this. Uh. Okay. Great. So, uh, but uh, the disadvantage of adjacency matrix is not it's it's not as intuitive as edge list. So, looking at this, uh, especially with large as the network size increase, it's difficult to uh, quickly get the the relationships that are underlying the network. Uh, so, it's uh, more suited to computers than human. But uh, anyway. Um, now these are the two structures that we can use to represent uh, the, the network, whether it's an edge list or uh, an adjacency matrix. So for uh, we can actually use I graph here uh, added little code so that we can convert an edge list to an adjacency matrix. All you need to do is to take your edge list and uh, make sure that it's in a matrix format because uh, the edge list that we have. Uh, introduced we have uh, uh, introduced was a data frame so you take the edge list you make it as, as a matrix and then you use graph from edge list and you can define whether it's directed or undirected and then you can convert it to an adjacency matrix so this is uh, using i graph you can go from an edge list to the recommended uh, data structure which is an adjacency matrix and here I defined it to be sparse true, which makes it an uh, even more efficient way to uh, store the adjacency matrix. 
because it's a binary matrix and it's very sparse. Yeah. So. So this is this uh, one. Literally. Yeah. One question here: the edge list that you convert to a matrix, mm -hmm. it's a two-column matrix then, with exactly. the from and the two. Okay. Yeah. Because exactly. I. I don't know. I think in uh, IGRAT there is also a function to convert the edge list to a matrix without changing it to a graph first. Or I don't remember if I coded the function myself or uh, if it was included in the package. It's easy to do. You can do a, a nested for loop. And then uh, so you construct the, the matrix full of zeros. And mm -hmm. then you just have to replace the the ones at the intersection uh, by indexing the columns and the, the rows in your nested for loop. Yeah. So uh, uh, I found similar solutions on, on Stack Overflow. Uh, but for here, because we are making uh, heavy use of iGraph, I thought I would make everything uh, consistent with the iGraph. Um, OK. Uh, it might be more efficient with, uh, with iGraph. Uh, because if you have to run a for loop on a gigantic matrix and mm -hmm. check all the intersection between the rows and columns, it could take some time with uh, with large networks. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I remember before using before uh, using iGraph, I used to do it the this way, uh, the lengthy way, and it wasn't very efficient and. Uh, yeah, I was happy to hear about iGraph and start using this approach. Uh, so I, I think with, with this, uh, this is all for chapter five. It was all about understanding the difference between edge list and adjacency matrices, and that they are both of them are valid ways to make a network, but each has its pros and cons. Yeah, and that adjacency matrix is the recommended data structure. So this was it for chapter five. Uh, so for chapter six, uh, so chapter six, there was a large part of it was about how to create a project. And I thought I would make, instead of sharing all the, the content and the screenshot, I would just make a demo, a quick demo of how to make a project in our studio. So let me first see if, how can I escape this? Next for screen. Okay, so can can you see our studio now? Yep. Okay, great. So yeah, so if 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 you if you're not so very experienced with R and yeah, I think. The best way to work with R is to first start an R, uh, an R project and then do all the analysis inside R project to make the work more reproducible and easy to share with others. Uh, so to do this from R Studio, you can use the, go to this icon, the this cube, and then press here. Uh, oh, forget about this. So when you press this, you get uh, a few options. You, you can either start a new directory. Or if you have a version, uh, an existing directory that you would like to add the the project to it, or if you have a GitHub repository and you would like to clone this GitHub locally and then make an R project out of it. So, for example, if you do this, you can go here, press Git, and then you will add your GitHub, and then the R Studio will uh, clone the GitHub repository locally, and then you will have an R project connected to your uh, GitHub repository. But uh, the way that I would like to show is to uh, use the first option, which is start a directory. And then here you would say whether you would like to start a project or would like many other options. But for our example, we would like to make an R project. And you would just write the name of the project and just say create project. But it's very easy to, to do from uh, R Studio. And I think that this is the the recommended or best practice for doing analysis is to have an, a dedicated project for your analysis to make things reproducible and easy to share. So 
yeah, uh, this is the creating project part. There was another part about manual data entry. So I don't think that in practice, especially working with network analysis and having uh, large uh, matrices that you will ever need to do manual entry or you will be building the network manually. Uh, but uh, anyway, if you would like to work interactively with a data frame or to make edits to a table, you can do this without going to Excel as recommended in the book. You can, for example, in R, uh, you can use fix. So fix is a function. So for example, if you have a, a table and this table is called uh, here, uh, empty cars. And then you can use fix. And you will have this window. And in this window, you can interact with the table. And you can modify some values. So for example, you, know, you can modify some values. Then do a few things. And this would be the manual entry. So. Now I can go back to empty cars and see that you can edit things manually. So again, this is not the best or the advised way to modify a matrix or modify a data structure in R. Uh, but if you would like to go manual and interactive way, this is one way to use fix function from base R. The other way and uh, is using a, a package called data edit R. And here, let's run it. So it gives you more control, as you can see from this window. And uh, here you can still work. And uh, you can highlight some parts, the columns, the rows, and you can, it works like, like a Google Sheet or something. So here I can go there and then zero. I use tab to move from one cell to the other. You can use the cursor, uh, the, the keyboard to move from one cell to the other and make the changes that you want. You can also uh, filter the rows. You can download everything. And yeah, so these are two ways. So using fix from this R or data editor package to interact manually with, with tables that you might have and you would like to uh, modify. Do you have any questions here, Pierre? No, I usually go back to the Excel file. Yeah. So uh, I I don't remember when was the last time I used Excel for data entry, to be honest. Uh, and fix, I only knew it and when I was still learning about R, but I never made use out of it. Uh, I think sometimes <laughs> the fact that you know about this function uh, might compromise your way of thinking because you might find it easier to do. Uh, so yeah, I like to forget about six <laughs> sometimes. Uh, well, it depends what I have to do. Sometimes I just, uh, I have the, the file, I import the original file and then I have a script for cleaning. Like can mm -hmm. be like changing, I don't know, some strings, some values. And then I, I store the clean data set somewhere else. Yeah. I keep the row that is completely dirty. And that way I know that I haven't touched the row and I know how to fix it. Okay. So yeah, I, I think uh, I only hear about this, uh, data edit R when I was preparing for this meeting, but uh, I haven't used it yet, but it, it seems very powerful. Okay, so the last part of this chapter and the last part of uh, this meeting would be about now that we know the recommended structures for making the network. So how can we finally make the network? Okay. So to here, I'm going back to the example that you have seen before using edge list. And this is how it looks like. You have the vectors, you make a matrix out of them. So here it's a matrix. I'm using CPind to make a two column matrix representing the network. And then another way to make the network is to have an adjacency matrix. And here you have the adjacency matrix of the same network. So to make a network, 
we will be using iGraph. And from iGraph, you can either start with an edge list or you can start with an adjacency matrix. So to start with an edge list, it will provide the matrix of edge list, the two columns, and you can set the type of the network. Here I said it's a not directed, directed set to false. And you assign it to a network, and here I printed the network. So what you can see here is that in when you print iGraph, it gives you, I think this is an ID for the object or something. I'm not sure what this is. Because even if you have the same network, uh, but like you made the same network multiple, you try to reproduce it, it will give you each time a different uh, ID. But anyway, what you can see here is that you have uh, UN. So UN means undirected. Uh, and then you have five and six. So five and six, these are the number of vertices and the number of edges. So here we have five nodes, five vertices, and six edges, six connections between them. And the rest are other, uh, so this is what it says, vertices. And yeah, and here are the attributes. You have the names, uh, the edges of this network. You can get it from uh, vertex names. But, and here down, we have the relationships. We have uh, Mark to Peter, Mark to Gel. So these are the lengths. And similar to what we have seen here, starting with an edge list, we can do the same with an adjacency matrix and make the same network. And uh, if we did this network, uh, yeah, it's, you will get, get the same network using adjacency or an edge list. So uh, here I just added like a UN is undirected. If it is a directed graph, you use DN. And then it will, the following numbers are the numbers of vertices and number of edges. Uh, one thing to note, uh, to be careful when you are uh, making the network is that if you are starting with an edge list, you can set directed to false. But this option, uh, this argument is not available to in this in this function. So when you are start starting with adjacency, you will use the argument mode, and then in mode you can pick whether it's a directed, undirected, or weighted, or many other options. So as you can see, it's not only that the edge list that adjacency matrix is recommended and it's uh, uh, better to use than an edge list, but also computationally, iGraph supports more uh, supports adjacency matrix and gives more options to adjacency matrices compared to edge list. Okay, so uh, now that we have the network here, if you want to like to look at the nodes or the, the vertices of this network, you can use the function v. And then it will return the, the vertices. So here we have five vertices. Uh, these are the number of the, comp uh, the names of the uh, vertices. And if you'd like to look at the edges, so you can use the function e. And then you can see here the, the number of ed the edges that you have. So it shows that the connections between the different vertices that we saw here. And finally, uh, to have a look on the network, you can simply print plot of the network and it will return the, the network. So here it shows the five vertices. So we have one, two, three, four, five. And we have uh, six, we should have six links. So this one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and here we can see that Mark has two connections. Or here Mark with one with Peter, one with Gel. So it's connected to Peter and it's connected to Gel. And yeah, we can see that Mark is not connected to Bob. And we can already see it here, that we can see a link between Mark and Bob. So as you, as you can already see that the plotting using uh, I uh, graph is very rudimentary and it's not very beautiful. Uh, but in the next chapter, which will be focused only on network visualization and aesthetics, We'll go deeper on how to modify and improve the appearance and aesthetics of this network, and also how to use other libraries like uh, GG, ggGraph, and tidygraphs. Yeah. So with this, I actually have no more to say. It was just like very two short chapters. I tried to summarize them uh, very briefly. Yeah. So. Do you have any questions there or any comments? Uh, no, I think it's good. Looking forward to the next one.
Awesome, yeah. I think with the, with the next chapter, we'll start to get into the nitty gritty of networks and the analysis and visualization. So we, we, we're all, so far, we have been only warming up and uh, giving some background to people that are not very familiar with R or with iGraph. I think the next one is going to be yeah much harder. Getting yeah. to a to a nice visualization with no overlaps and or a different layout is sometimes tricky. Yeah, yeah, the, the networks I work with are uh, directed and they are usually somewhat pyramidal. So you need to have the nodes on different levels, specific levels, and it can be tricky to to find how to represent them on the X and Y axis. And which, uh, back, back then for this analysis, which uh, plotting library were you using? Uh, I was using iGraph. Okay. It's, it's possible with iGraph. You just need to uh, to provide the, the a matrix of coordinates. Yeah, you provide a matrix of coordinates for, for each node, and then it's placing the nodes. But it's, yeah, the first time is a bit tricky. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I will, I will try to make things, uh, to make it intuitive to translate from iGraph to ggGraph or tidygraph. Uh, but let's see how this will turn out. There is a good uh, blog about iGraph. I think it's called Cotero, Coteto, something. Uh, Cot Cotero. Is it? It's from this, uh, I think, Russian lady. Mario? I will try to, to find it and send it to you. Yeah, you can put it on Slack. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, uh, great. So see you next week. Yes. Yeah, have a nice evening. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.